well, uh, that was fun, and it's exciting to see all the new life in our church and um, the young ones, and we're grateful for that God has blessed us in that way. So uh, today we are coming to the conclusion of our uh, series on unexpected encounters, and uh, I always don't like the end of series uh, because, um, one, I spent a lot of time on the bumpers and, and you know, that's it. It's gone. It's done, over, done with. Uh, so, but no, honestly, it's because there's so many times where I wish I could have spent more time on something, gone deeper in something. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's always that sense of, oh, I would have, I wish I would have said this, or I wish I would have done that. And, um, but this has been a fun one, uh, and uh, I think this last one will be a good conclusion. And, and I was just reminded as I was going through it, we get this. Um, this whole series has been based on the fact that when you meet Jesus, it, he changes you, and you'll never be the same. When you encounter Jesus, you, he alters your, the course of your life. And I was thinking about, we get this, even if you are here today and you don't know Christ yourself and you're kind of still exploring, you you have met someone in your life who has changed the course of your life. A spouse, a mentor, a good friend. You know, you know those people who your life would not be the same if you had not met them and they changed the course. And so what 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 I'm saying is basically when Jesus of all the people you meet in life is the most radical change that you'll make. It's, it's, it's like meeting someone like your spouse, mentor, friend, but magnified. Uh, he is the one who changes life the most for any who meet him. Um, and so uh, my prayer is that through one of the people we've talked about or the encounters we've explored, uh, you'll, you'll see yourself. Um, and so today's is what I would consider, it's one of those most theologically uh, profound encounters um, in the sense of it, it really, like if you have a, like if you have, let's say you're in a theological camp or you have some sort of, uh, you believe certain things, this encounter will challenge it. Uh, it'll, it you've got to fit this one in your theological box or something's off with your theology. And so before I say who it is, I'm going to put a quote up here that you may have heard or may not have heard. Um, it says, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. Have you guys heard that? Ne- never? No one's ever heard that. Okay, a few people. All right, so it's attributed to Francis, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, who, who is our current pope's you know, he's, he changed his name to Francis to after this guy. It's just, F, you know, little trivia. Um, and, and because of his admiration for him. So, and the idea is, is that your life should preach the gospel. You shouldn't need words if your life is truly reflecting the gospel as it is. And so how many of you think that's a wonderful sentiment? Okay, I think it's hot garbage. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm being a little, a little facetious, but it, one, I should just say a couple things. Francis of Assisi never said this. Uh, it was, I guess someone made it and they wanted it to sound good. So they gave him kind of credit, uh, but he never said it. And even if he did say it, who cares? It's some guy. It's not from scripture. What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible actually says something very opposite. Um, Romans 10, 13 to 14, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fantastic. Well, then how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how do they believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they here without someone preaching? It's basically saying you, you've got to tell people the gospel or they don't know what to believe. Um, and that's kind of like just kind of talking about the how would it be possible if... But Ezekiel actually really puts a burden of responsibility on us. And it says, 
in Ezekiel 3.18, if, you say to the, if, if I say to the wicked, and that's saying if God says to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked man from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I shall require at your hand. Oof. The, the, the idea is you, you cannot stay silent. You, that, is, that is not an option. And so when I think of that phrase, that's, that's immediately where I go. I think, oh, no, you, you can't you, use words if necessary. Words are always necessary. You know, come on, you got to use words. Yeah. But today's encounter actually challenges me and my assumption. Because the person we're going to look at today, today never had anyone preach the gospel to him. And it's the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, if you guys know the story, I'll, I'll jump to the end. You guys are, I'll ruin the surprise ending. He comes to faith, okay? Uh, wonderful story. But you never hear of a story of someone saying, hey, thief, before you die, you need to place your faith in Christ. No one says those words to him. And if, and if you, he's also ruins the box of people who say you have to get baptized before in order to be saved because he didn't get baptized and he, and he ruins the box of people who say oh you've got to do some your your good works have to outweigh your 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 bad works because he just didn't have a chance or time to you know he's being executed for crimes he committed which he confesses he committed and then he dies but yet Jesus says that he will go with him in paradise this guy challenges the box of so many I know branches or thoughts on what must you do to be saved and so even my own of saying you know someone someone must present the gospel to this person and they must consent and then be saved that it's challenged this guy is one of those ones that I like and as I dug into it I got really I nerded out I'm sorry um but uh, this, this, I love this story. Uh, and I'll, say, I'll start off by saying I feel bad for him a little bit. Can you imagine, like, the worst day of your life where it, it is like the, you know, you are gonna, you're going through the worst day, worst imaginable thing that could ever happen to you, and nobody even cares. No one notices. No one even goes, oh, I'm, man, stinks for him. And the reason being is because his worst day was happening at the same time that Jesus' worst day was happening. And, and, and like if you, if you ever want to be unnoticed, stand around a celebrity. And no one cares who you are. They just want to see the celebrity. And that's what basically was happening is that he was basically invisible because Jesus' shadow was being cast over him. I mean, just think about this. Like, when Jesus is being under, like, the trial of Jesus and Pontius Pilate is, is kind of weighing and people are chanting and, you know, all these kind of things. And, and so, all of a sudden, he's in this cell, which is like for the people who are going to be crucified today. And the jailer opens it up and says, hey, which one of you is Barabbas? No, I'm sure he may have, like, if he would have known, he would have been, me, 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 you know, kind of, and they could argue for it. Uh, but he doesn't know, and then they let Barabbas out, and he's like, oh, maybe there's going to be mercy on us today. Ah, oh, no, no, they just, they bring Jesus in instead of him, and, you know, you're, yeah, no, we don't even know his name, to be released. And then on the, the Via Della Rosa, which is the path in which they walked with their crosses from the you know uh, the the cells where they were stayed to the 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 Golgotha the mountain upon which they would be crucified. You know the, there's tons of people around, but none of them even probably notice him. I wonder if he you know if if in foresight or if he had any foresight if he would have just ditched his cross and dived into the crowd if he would have been able to get away. Um, because everyone was focused so much on the Jesus guy that he was barely even visible. 
And then when he's actually crucified and lifted up, I don't know to the right or to the left, but for some odd reason, I think he's on Jesus' right. I don't know. Does anyone else, have, does anyone have a poll? You know, the good thief, is he, when you imagine it, is he here or is he there? Uh, so, any thoughts? No. Okay, all right. I have no, I don't know which side he was on, but whatever side he gets lifted up, there's tons of people around, but no one's looking at him. No family like Jesus has. No friends like Jesus has. Not, not even mockers or scoffers that are throwing, you know, bystanders who are throwing insults at Jesus are there for him. And this is the craziest piece. Both Mark and uh, Matthew say it basically the same way. This is Mark chapter five, uh, 15, 25 to 32, and it says that it was the third hour when they crucified him, Jesus, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads at him and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those, and listen to this, and those who were crucified, the two thieves, with him also reviled him. Can you imagine being so desperate to feel like you're, you're seen or that you belong, that while you're being crucified, you decide, I'm going to be a part of the, the gang who's keeping you know, insults on Jesus. I'm going to join in so I can feel like I'm a part of something because otherwise I'm invisible. I mean, I, I think it would I don't know if you're ever in a situation like this where if you've been the target of someone's, you know, a bully or something like that, you've been the target and that, that bully now focuses on someone else as the target. It, it, the tendency sometimes is for people to join in because at least the attention's not on me. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of how what this, this thief is going through. is like, you know, they're, they're deriding and mocking Jesus. And at least it's not on me. And maybe I'll feel like I'm, I'm a little bit better than this guy if I join in. It's a pretty desperate and sad place to be. Yet here's the amazing part. In the next three hours... Something changes in this guy's heart. For he goes from being a guy who, who is so pathetic that as he's dying, he's mocking Jesus to a guy who places his faith in Jesus and becomes, at least in our timeline, the first person who gets into heaven by the blood of Christ. You know... The first person, when Jesus, like, you know, enters in, he's, like, walking behind him, dumbfounded, you know, unaware. I can't believe this is happening to me. This is what happened in that three hours to convince this guy that he had made a mistake and he was actually should now choose Jesus. That's what I want to look at. And the only thing that this guy had that was maybe a special privilege for him was that he had probably one of the most front row seats to seeing Jesus die uh, more than anyone else. He was there the entire time and saw every little bit of it. He saw that when when they approached this, this is uh, Matthew 27, 33, 34, when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink of it. Basically what this is, is I mean, it's going to sound crude, but it's basically, I'm going to make you drunk enough so that you're numb enough, so that when you're being crucified, you're at least not fully, like, you know, you're not fully there. You're, you're slightly inebriated or you're, 
so that you can be numb to some of the pain that you're going to be going through. I think it's like one of the last merciful things they do to someone who's being crucified was to let them drink this really you know, potent wine so that they would kind of have a little bit of pain relief as they suffered. And so I'm sure he took it and just like, sw- you know, downed it because he didn't want to feel this. But yet he sees Jesus say, no, thank you. I don't think he said no, thank you, but you know what I mean. Jesus says, no, I don't want it. And so he sees Jesus choosing to be fully cognizant, to be fully in control of his faculties as he dies. And then crowds of people just like passers by what it says, Matthew 27, 39 to 40, and it says, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. You are the son of God, come down from the cross. And so he's just seeing people just taunting Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus says nothing in return. He doesn't, doesn't spit venom at them. He's, no, there's no anger coming back. Uh, towards the crowds who say it. And it's not just the crowds. It's like the celebrities come out to taunt Jesus as well. The chief priests uh, come to ridicule a dying man, Matthew 27, 41 to 43. And so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, I do wonder, and I'm going to imagine a little bit during this time. So bear with me. If I'm off, I'm off. Okay, this is me. I wonder if when they said these things, he saw maybe a little bit of fear behind their eyes. As 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 they were taunting Jesus saying, you know, he claimed to be the son of God. I would love to see you show up as the son of God and come down off that cross. You know, oh, then we would believe you. The reality is if he came off that cross, they would be terrified and they would need to change their undergarments. You know that, you know, because they, they would have realized they just crucified the son of God and they, they would be terrified. And so I wonder if he saw something as they're like, ha, ha, please don't, you know what I mean, kind of thing, as, they, as he, they taunted him to come off the cross. They were really hoping he stayed on the cross. You know, as, as a kid, um, you know, you guys know, I was a superhero fan as a kid. Uh, and one of the things that I used to love was uh, the old Incredible Hulk show. You guys remember the old Incredible Hulk show, Lou Ferrigno and... If you have, it doesn't hold up anymore. I'm not going to say it's like, you know, but back at the time, it was so awesome. Uh, And there was always these scenes. It's like, like, I feel like my kids shows, like it was the same plot every episode. Is that, is that just you? But it seemed like the same plot every episode, but yet Bruce Banner, who in the show was David Banner, but I'm going to say Bruce Banner. Okay. All right. So Bruce Banner, who's the, the human form of the Hulk, would, would get into a situation and like someone would, would knock over a building on top of them to kill him. You know what I mean? Uh, they wanted to get rid of Bruce Banner and they would knock the building down and they would say, we got him. He's dead. You know? And then they would have that moment where you see his eyes and then he opens them and they're green. You know? um, and then you know he's transforming. And the very next second, you know, out of the rubble would burst the Hulk. You know? And then those people would run terrified in every direction because the Hulk would like, then start tossing them. And, and, you know, that's what I imagine is happening here as these people think they're killing Jesus. That if if this guy made that, oh, wait, if he comes off that cross, you guys are dead. He's going to come with an army. Can you imagine, like, you know, the nails, poof, poof, you know, popping out? And, oh, you know, um, it would have been a terrifying thing. And I wonder if he saw a little fear in their eyes. Um, but what he definitely saw was that Jesus did not respond. He actually seemed to show care for his ridiculers. Luke 23, 33 to 34 says, And when they came to the place that is called the school, 
And they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do while as they cast lots to divide his garments. So Jesus is up on this cross and he's watching that before he's even dead, they're taking his stuff and saying, hey, do you want this uh, tunic? Yeah, hey, how about this? You know, let's... uh, Let's see what I get to keep and what you get to keep. And, and, and Jesus is saying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And not only that, as he's suffering, you would think that he would expect people to care for him, but he's, he's arranging for his mom to be taken care of. You know, this is John 19, 26, 27. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. You, this is not the behavior you would expect of someone who's being crucified. If Jesus is taking care of other people, being kind and forgiving of other people, the people who are doing this to him. And, and what I will say, and I'll go into it a little bit more, it's, he, he wasn't hearing the gospel. No one's preaching the gospel to Jesus, or not to, to the thief, I'm sorry. No one's preaching the gospel to the thief, but he's seeing it with his own eyes. Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of others so that he dies so that you might live. This passage doesn't tell us exactly how it happened, but at some point the thief's observation of Jesus changes his heart towards him. He he sees this guy and he says, wait, he's not the bad guy that you guys are all saying he is. He's not. It's interesting. The other criminal, this is Luke 23, 39 to 41. It says one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him. This is the one we're talking about, saying, they could have just here right said, the one on the left, you know? (laughs) But no, the other um, rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. In that statement, what you realize is that he's realized certain things. He's realized is that Jesus is not begging to get off this cross. He's not trying to save himself. He's there by choice. I wonder, and this is probably the most wonder, you know, I wonder if he put two and two together when they, when they said that, you know, you said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. I wonder if he figured out that Jesus was talking about himself. I don't know. No one else did. Um, but I wonder But what he does know is he sits there and he rebukes the other thief for saying, do you not fear God? Means basically saying, ridiculing this guy is to go against God. And so he realizes that Jesus is a good and godly man of God. God is doing something through this. And and as everyone mocks and derides Jesus... For being weak, I think he realizes, no, no, this guy's actually stronger than anyone who's taunting him. Because if the roles were reversed, oh, you would be begging and you would be crying and you would be spitting venom. He realizes that Jesus is a great man and he realizes that Jesus is an innocent man. That he had done nothing wrong. This, is, this kind of struck me. They're taunting him for, they're saying like, one of the ones is like, you saved others, why don't you save yourself? That's kind of one of their taunts, which is just an interesting way of looking at it. Like, I mean, that would be saying, taunting someone saying like, you fed the poor, 
but you didn't eat yourself. As if that's a bad thing. And at some point, if you hear someone saying, wait, so he saved all these other people and he's not saving himself and you're criticizing him for that? Is that like, is that a bad thing? Is that something? And, and, and if you think about it long enough, you realize, wait, that's, just, that's a bizarre taunt. That makes no sense. You're acknowledging that he saved other people. He should be a hero, and yet you're wanting him to die for that. That makes zero sense. And so in, in, in this very odd way, and this is where I'm going to say, this is where we're going to go deep, okay? All right? In a very odd way, he does hear the message of Christ, but indirectly. He hears about who Jesus is through the taunts and mockery of other people. It's crazy. He, he hears them call him, oh, you're the king of the Jews, you're the king, you know. And, but that's not the only word. Because if you just said you're the king of the Jews, he might oh, he's a revolutionary. He's, uh, you know, he's trying to throw off the Roman rule. But then they also start throwing out words like the Christ of God, the Son of God, you know, the chosen one. Uh, they're using other words. And he's like, wait, well, hold on. Aren't those words, aren't those reference of the Messiah? Aren't those words that we only use for that one? And, you know, and, and so he, he realizes that, wait, maybe you've got this whole king of the Jews thing wrong, and he is this Messiah that we've been talking about. And, it's, and he, you, you, this is one of the ones we know for sure, is he does realize Jesus is a king, but of a different kingdom. Because in Luke 23, 42, after he's finished criticizing the other and telling the other thief to shut it, He turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's like, this guy is a king. He is the chosen one. He is the son of God. And he's realizing that they were talking about the wrong kingdom. And for the first time, Jesus then turns to him and I think says, the only words that would give comfort and peace to a man who had been invisible before, no one had seen and was at death's door, 2343, and he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I mean, it just hits. This guy had put together that Jesus was a savior. He was a king. And he was a good and righteous man just from hearing the people scorn and mock him. And was able to see how Jesus, and the reason he could put that together was because of how Jesus was responding in a way that was so unlike any other person. This isn't just a beautiful story of last second salvation. It is a great reminder to us that sometimes, and this is the simple application that we can all take on, sometimes people look at how we live and how we behave and how we act and how we treat others, and that opens them up to the words that we say out of our mouths about what is truth and not truth. This guy was converted to Christ because of his behavior and then received the truth and came to know him. It reminds me of stories. um, It's been a while, but there there are stories of, you know, prisoner of war camps and um, Vietnam stories, Korea um, I'm sure in any situation, oftentimes what they do in these prisoner situations is they try to, um, I don't know the best word, brainwash. They, they, you know, they, they say things over and over and over again, use exhaustion and sleep deprivation, and they keep saying like, you know, your nation is evil. You're, you know, kind of trying to implant thoughts into your head uh, th- so that you'll turn on the nation that you were fighting for beforehand. Uh, 
Uh, they try to manipulate and torture. And yet oftentimes what happens is the, the, they, the people realize that the one, their captors are evil who are doing this, and it makes them only love their country more or love their cause more because they just realize that if you're saying this, then I know you're a liar and you're wrong. Uh, and so I'm going to resist even more. One of my favorite stories about this was in a Vietnam, Vietnamese POW camp. There was a soldier who, um, and I don't know the details, it's, this is like secondhand stories, but there was a soldier who was resistant, and for being resistant to their, their persuasions, uh, he got given latrine duty, which is the worst of the worst, you know what I mean? It's like you've got to deal with people's waste, and it's just awful, disgusting, disgusting job. And so, but one day when he's in there cleaning the area out, which you can imagine is just disgusting, he sees a page, and, and on that page he sees John written in the top right corner, and he realizes it's the page of the Bible, um, and that, this, that they were using the Bible as toilet paper. Uh, and so when he realizes this, he volunteers for latrine duty day after day after day after day to fetch pages of the Bible out of this outhouse, waste area, and put together the precious word for them. And you get to think there, you know, this is a filth-covered pages of paper, but because of where they were and what they were enduring, it was precious. Precious, because someone else, that if they think this is waste, I know this is valuable. Sometimes when people see the behavior of those who mock versus the behavior of those who live by the truth, that alone lets them know who's in the right. It was the way that Jesus responded that, and he, that he realized you're twisting his words. And that one, I mean, in one of the most, I would say, divine acts of providence for this thief, they chose to mock Jesus with his own teaching. And so he got to hear Jesus teach because of their mocking of him. And he came to believe. I just think about, you know, and this is, this is going to be interesting. You guys are going to fall in one of two camps. Uh, there are the people who, who say nothing and try to just win people over by living their life. And then there are people who say, all they do is say stuff and don't live it out. And we tend to lean one way or the other, and you have to figure out. Because I think about, you know, when you go someplace, and I'm sure you've been there. I remember when I was in college, I would walk the campus, and there would be a guy with the signs out um, about Jesus saves, you know, repent or die, you know, those kind of things. And everyone just avoided. They just walked around. They didn't want to have, you know, and they saw it every day. And, I'm, and this is going to sound, hear me out. Maybe they didn't need to hear it again. They need to see him actually loving people and caring for them enough so that these words would be received. Does that make sense? Sometimes, sometimes people don't need to hear you tell them that they need Jesus again if they've heard it time and time again. Sometimes they need to see you be Jesus to them and care for them and love them the way they ought to. Does that make sense? But the opposite is true too. Sometimes you can care for people and love them and do and serve and be kind and loving to them all day long. But at some point they need to hear that Jesus loves them too and cares for them. Because the reality is that what this thief saw was not just the words that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He didn't just hear that. He saw someone literally dying on a cross for his sins. And that made all the difference. And we have to sit there and wonder, 
Am I just speaking words? Or am I actually showing people that these words are true? That is the challenge before us. That's what this guy, I think, causes us to shoot for. And so I want you to hear this. Um, I, the, the gospel does not, and this is, you can put this on, the gospel is not just meant to be heard, it's also meant to be observed. Does that make sense? The gospel is not just meant to be heard, it's meant to be observed. It, it needs both of these things. For if people don't observe it and all they do is hear it, then they might be turned off to it. And if people, all they do is observe it and never hear it, they don't know what they're seeing, really. And obviously the opposite is true as well. Gospel is not to be observed, but it's also heard. There's two sides to this coin. It makes me think about, you know, when uh, John 14, 6 is the famous passage where Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Um, when I think about that, and I don't know that I need to study this one a little bit more, but it makes me think he's more than just the truth. He's also the way, which means the choice you make, which path are you going to take? And he's also the life, meaning that how you live, he's also that too. And that's a great way of saying, am I making the choices? Am I living the life? Am I speaking the truth? Because it's not just one of those things. He's all three. If we hope for people to encounter Jesus for themselves, we need to tell them, but we also need to show them what it means to live and love Jesus like we do. Um, so if I were to sit there and modify that wrongly attributed quote by Francis Assisi, I would basically say this, preach the gospel at all times, amen, with your words and your life. Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you so much for the thief on the cross and what he and what he teaches us and how he challenges us to um, demonstrate what it means to know your truth in a way that impacts our behavior, how we respond, and, and all of it. I can't imagine, Lord, not just to actually see Jesus give his life to save others. I was struck by how one thief said, save yourself and save us. But the other thief knew that in order to save us, you could not save yourself. Help us to see what a remarkable thing you did. Help us to be impacted and forever changed because of it. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.